Uh, Monty Butte, I'm a homeless guy. I sleep a lot at Dorothy Day Center. No, Monty Butte, I'm a professor at Metropolitan State University, uh, 73 and still going strong. Uh, and I'm Rob Hahn, I'll ask the questions today. It's uh, December 27th, 2018, and we are at the University Club in St. Paul, Minnesota. Let's start uh, with your initial impressions of Dinkytown in what I think you told me was 1966. Um, well, I was a uh, hick in those days and had just come to the cities for the first time and uh, had spent uh, a year at uh, a junior college and then a year at a junior college. So just being on the university campus was the most overwhelming thing imaginable. And then drifting off the campus into Dinky Town, it was just like uh, uh, the circus is in town. You never knew what you'd see. You never, you didn't understand half the stuff going on. So it was kind of a magnet early on for me. Um, let me take you through some of the, uh, the haunts, if you will, and tell me your thoughts about them. Not only then, but maybe now as yeah, well. Yeah. And let's start with Al's breakfast. Uh, Al's breakfast. I think I had my first breakfast there in 1966, and of course it was just a place to eat breakfast. But once you've had breakfast at Al's, you know, it becomes your favorite place for life. I was a farm boy, and once I moved to the cities, uh, my, the, my first meal of the day had to be breakfast. And often I'd race to Al's by 10 to 1 because they shut the doors then if you were in by then. And so over the years, I was a regular at Al's eating breakfast, and you never knew who you saw in there, former governors, NBA stars, uh, but it was just the strangest place. Again, uh, that rural background, you didn't see things like Al's. Then there's Gray's Drug, uh, above which you lived for a while. Yeah, I lived uh, right next door to the room that uh, Bob Dylan had. Uh, I and my girlfriend were up there, and that was fantastic. And Gray's Drug uh, was also quite a magnet for people. They had, I think, uh, 99 cent special breakfasts, and I'd go down there and eat regularly and run into all kinds of people there. Uh, yeah, so Gray's was another primo, primo spot. When you arrived in Dickey Town, the anti-war movement was really gaining steam. What was it, in your opinion, about the mood, the atmosphere of Dinky Town that lent itself to the anti-war crowd? Um, well, I think particularly because of the artistic heritage uh, in Dinky Town, that was sort of there prior to a lot of politics going on. I think the earlier politics was more DFL-oriented, young people and stuff but it was just a natural place to gravitate. There wasn't much on the other side of the campus, and so I think just people there in the West Bank, I and mean, then it was kind of, uh, you needed a uh, rapid transit between Dinky Town and the West Bank in those days. But the West Bank was more the home of the hippie crowd, the alternative stuff, and I think Dinky Town was a mix of both, but I think the politicos uh, gravitated more to uh, Dinky Town. Tell me about your relationship, especially as it applies to some of the anti-war protests and activities, your relationship with Bill Tilton. Um, I got to know Bill in 1970, uh, and Bill was sort of the prototype 1970 uh, large university student president. He was clean cut, he was well spoken, he was a man groomed for leadership. Um, and then of course the bottom dropped out with uh, them being ratted out by one of the Minnesota Eight. And I think it changed Bill in all kinds of ways. I don't think if that hadn't have happened, he would have been, gone on to be an illustrious mainstream leader in the Twin Cities. And I think that and the time in federal prison altered his life. And I think then he gravitated to the many, working with many of the people uh, around Wounded Knee and other causes. So I think it altered the course of his life quite a bit. While he was in prison, I think that coincided with 
you kind of taking the lead on some of these anti-war activities. Well, it was, it was strange. I remember he later told me, he said, they were sitting in federal prison and watching me stir up a crowd. <laughs> he still remembered that. But my story was a little different. I was never a, a character who was part of formal organizations and stuff. One of the odd things was, I was at all of these things, but I was a little more than a foot soldier. Somehow, uh, a megaphone fell into my hands the day before. There was a huge demonstration against Cedar Square West on the West Bank, and they brought George Romney in, Mitt's daddy, and he was going to inaugurate this. And they had six-foot fences all the way around it, and there was such protest that the crowd smashed down all the fences. They rushed uh, Romney into a limousine. He rushed off. They never inaugurated things that day. And then it sort of became guerrilla theater. And I had a gift for gab. I had an afro like this, uh, wire rim glasses. So I was, afterwards, I realized half the reason I fell into what I did was I was photogenic, the stereotypical, you know, student leader. And I was great at strategy, you know, moving and tactical. So I kind of became a field commander by accident. Um, and then the next day, because of activity the day before, uh, we were in front of Northrop Auditorium and a crowd slowly gathering and somebody leaked to me that Charlie Stenvig, the chief of police in Minneapolis and the university administration were in league and Charlie was a no-nonsense right-wing uh, bust their heads kind of guy and there was a place where they towed cars to uh, it was called uh, Kohler's Garage they put a huge tactical squad into that building, hid him in there. He got word, somebody got word to me that he had seen him going in there. So I immediately, my thought in the back of my head is we've got to provoke those pigs <laughs> in, the, in the vernacular of the time. So we immediately took a crowd over to the recruiting office in Dinkytown and raised hell there. And that didn't quite bring the tactical squad out. So another guy that was very active and helpful in this too, sort of a, uh, we picked up power in the streets, was Dean Zimmerman. And we split the crowd and headed down to the armory, which was uh, maybe five, six blocks down. They were, the armory was old granite, bricks and it was surrounded by wire or by steel posts and stuff people started ripping these right out of the ground well that was finally enough here comes the tactical squad swinging clubs everywhere so we had succeeded in the first step of provoking this into a lot more but it was that kind of activity. So I certainly wasn't any formal leader. I was more someone with enough moxie to pick up power when he saw laying in the streets and jumped into it. What was the uh, president of Minnesota's reaction to these protests? Well, what was fascinating was Malcolm Moose was the president. And he was pretty cocky. He, he, this was one of the campuses that hadn't really gone haywire. And he bragged about it. Well, he's out of town for three days. And it, uh, his vice president, I think his name was Gene Eisenberg, Eidenberg, and it fell to him. Well, all hell break lo broke loose. What we did that day was we continually did guerrilla warfare. We would split crowds up and send them to new. The police had closed in on us one place, so we sent a huge crowd down to uh, Oaken, Washington, completely blocked that street. They'd come there, we'd move people down in front of Kaufman Union all day. And so their frustration, their first move was to call in the seven county emergency uh, police units. They had sheriffs, deputies, police from everywhere. 
and they couldn't regain control. Things just went crazy. So late afternoon, God knows whose idea was, but you know, Charlie Stenvig uh, had some wacky ideas. They had been shooting cannon, uh, uh, tear gas canisters uh, of uh, tear gas, and all of a sudden they took a helicopter up and started dropping tear gas first in front of Kaufman Union, or Kaufman Union all the way up to Northrop. Then they went into Dinkytown. There were child care centers, all kinds of businesses, and here is tear gas coming out of the sky, just blasting everybody in the area. Business people actually were coming out with wet rags to help people clean their eyes and stuff. So that was kind of the kind of day it was, and finally they had lost. We, they could not control this crowd because of our maneuvering. Uh, and at that point, the governor sent in 800 National Guard. They freaked out completely. Uh, and Stenvig lost control, but control went to the National Guard. Uh, you spent some time in Berkeley, both San Francisco and Berkeley. Yeah. Um, compare Berkeley to Dinkytown. Um, Dinkytown was kind of a mini-me <laughs> to Berkeley. Uh, it had, I mean, there was a magnitude of Berkeley, of the bookstores, the history. Uh, Dinkytown was a smaller version of that is all. Uh, but Dinkytown was uh, set in a major metropolitan area where Berkeley was off to itself on the edge of Oakland. So it was fairly autonomous. <laughs> Madison was very similar. But the same vibe, it just wasn't that kind of thing. And what was weird about the uh, 72 events is everybody else had become a, a, a touch point, whether it was Madison, Berkeley, Ann Arbor. And in 72, the reason that, that there was a strike and all those students' riots was that Nixon had escalated the war by mining the Haiphong Harbor. Um, and out of nowhere in 72, it's the University of Minnesota that's erupted. And that's what blew Moose's mind, is that it was here. In fact, after <clears throat> both of the two nights, uh, the day on the West Bank and what happened on campus, we went home and watched ourselves on the evening national news, and Eric Severide had a lead story one of the nights on what was going on there. But very much the same kind of place. You addressed it subtly earlier, but I wanted you to pick up as it applies to Dickytown, kind of the, poli the politics of the new left versus the hippies. What do you mean by that, and how did it manifest itself in Dickytown? Well, I think it was kind of a uh, cross-fertilization. But at the time, there were people who were the, uh, what was Leary's old thing, tune in, turn on, and drop out. Uh, and they were much more a culture that was around drugs, nonviolence, but not in a political way, alternative lifestyles, much more into change the world by changing yourself. The New Left was started off as sort of a reform movement, really, of young people, but it became more and more political. So you had these two groups at the extremes, and then you had maybe a third of the people that kind of moved back and forth between these. So you had characters like Jerry Rubin uh, and uh, Abby Hoffman who were sort of passing back and forth between them. But other people were primarily on one side or the other of it. But there was uh, enough common denominator that everybody felt themselves, I mean, the word was the movement. And the movement had both of these wings, very central. When you think of Dinky Town and a guy named Marv Davidoff, what do you think of? Well, Marv Davidoff was an old, I mean, I thought he was ancient at the time. He must have been in his 40s. 
And Marv was notorious because he was one of the first people to go down and was part of the Freedom Riders, was arrested, had been in Parchment Prison, and was a powerful convert to nonviolent revolution. And so he became sort of a mentor and a guru at this time because there was this gap. There weren't many people that were around anymore that had real significance who had been in the 30s. That was the last great uprising. So we were in many cases children running in the streets without parental figures to help us. And Marv was that way. He was just constantly teaching. We'd have nonviolent training. We'd talk about history. Uh, he was just everywhere. He had this huge, fantastic mustache, sort of uh, a Sam Elliott look without the hair with Marv. But, uh, so he was an instrumental figure. The other person who just uh, it was hard to imagine. Mulford Q. Sibley. He was a Quaker. He was a political science professor. He was uh, a pacifist to the point that he wore tennis shoes because he didn't want to touch leather or have anything to do with leather. Every day he wore a red tie and he said it was to honor the blood of the workers. So, but he was a democratic socialist and a pacifist. But he was a gentle, calming man. I still remember, I had dropped out of school at times. He taught political theory. And I would just stop in during his office hours, and I was a student at the university. And I would have read something, and he was willing to sit and talk with me. He made no distinction between student and non-student. But those two, and Marv particularly in the streets, was really important. He was running the Honeywell Project at the time. And the Honeywell Project was, Honeywell was making cluster bombs. And once it was discovered, they were being indiscriminately dropped from planes. And they were slaughtering animals women and children, they were just to clear villages and things. And these were the most hideous kind of bombs at that time. So Marv's Honeywell project had been going long before any of the anti-war stuff really got going. What's your take on, and maybe involvement as well, in the Red Barn protest? Uh, again, I was one of those people, particularly because I lived above Gray's Drug and it was just across the street. But uh, I joined in. Uh, I stayed there a lot of nights during it. Actually, the night of the bust, I wasn't there when they came in at 3 o'clock. But uh, I was there most of the time and active and talking with people and helping organize and stuff. But my role there was minimal. I was more just a participant in that process. Um, but just weird stuff. There was a sort of party atmosphere. Uh, Al Milgram's film, Dinky Town Uprising, was about part of that period. and. I still remember that there was a building that we were occupying that I think Al staged. <laughs> there was a cupola, I think that's what it's called, an opening with a lid that went up and down. And Al said to me, why don't you go up there and look out? So I go up there and look out and this thing's on my head and I'm wearing an army helmet of some sort with a big cigar wire ring glasses and this huge mustache. And it looked like Groucho Marx. And somebody's pulling the string so the cupola door is bouncing on my head. And that kind of humor. And he shot that and then he opened the film with that scene. <laughs> but even, even though you weren't there, um, tell me what you heard about the night of the bust. Well, I went home, I think, because we were just across the street about two o'clock, and that it was just a an assault. They came in with hell bent for leather, with tactical squads just rounding people up, throwing them in paddy wagons, 
and that was followed by drunk dump trucks and bulldozers and they just plowed what was remaining of buildings down, tore up the gardens that had been built, everything. So by six o'clock it was just like uh, a bomb had gone off. There was very little of anything there. And the timing of it was uh, just the time they wanted. Uh, and a number of reporters got caught up, the late Nick Coleman, uh, Mike Elf, and others who were there just as reporters got arrested and thrown in paddy wagons too. Uh, another person I want to ask you about is uh, Kristen I.D. Tullison. You said she's got a sense of mission. Yeah, particularly in the later years, uh, she uh, you know, there are always, you know, they talk about the grandma on the porch. <laughs> well, in her own way, she's certainly not that old, but she sort of became the grandma on the porch in many ways about protecting Dinky Town, fighting developers, that there was something almost sacred about that space. And can't you just once leave something alone? You know that old song, uh, putting up a parking lot, that sort of thing. So she also used the bookhouse, her bookstore there, more and more as a cultural event center. I you know I did two or three sessions there and put together panels. But it was a place that wasn't just a bookstore, it was a place to hang out. It was a place to come and hear talk, people talk and speak. But behind the scenes, she was never the person that needed to be out front. She was the person behind the scenes that was trying to keep everything going and moving and protecting people. Um, when you look back at your days in Dinky Town, how would you describe the impact it had on your life that followed? Oh, in many ways, uh, it was in the Twin Cities, it was my second home. You know, it, for physical space, it came as close. I grew up in a Mennonite colony in southwestern Minnesota and went through these things. And I never fit into that. Me and them, you know, Mennonites are nice people, but they're too tight-assed. So this became my replacement. It was sort of, in its own way, a, a, a space that was a utopian community. But it wasn't just a physical space. It was a milieu. It, there was an ambience about it that you almost felt like you were entering when you went into that area. For me at least, it was like the space outside a temple. There were the bookstores, there was Makash, there were the, the uh, music places like the Scholar. But it was a place that people who felt out of place where they came from, like this was a place that was their place. It was a place for those who had no place, who were outside of the mainstream, who were misfits, who were deviants, who were creatives. But they never were going to be the kind of person that went through every step properly. And of course that was why somebody like Dylan would end up there, and Colonel Ray and Glover, and all the different kind of people, political leaders that came out of there. So to me, I just have the fondest uh, memories of that and uh, helped in any way I could over the years with things. What do you think of Dinky Town today? Do you think it's lost? I, I can hardly go there. I can hardly go there. I, Kristen's bookstore is just a shell of what it was. Uh, and I used to try, it was just, I'm, I am a book nut. I have a house full of books and I would go at least once every two weeks to the bookstore and it was an excuse to drive from Woodbury in the East Metro to Dinky Town because then I'd go have breakfast at Al's. The same thing every time. 
I would have uh, a side of uh, Wally Blues, and I would have just the most incredible egg dish there. And that was a trip. I haven't been to Al's in two years. I stop by the Brookhouse occasionally, but it, it, it's everything wrong with America. That it can't even have small enclaves of pluralism, of alternative life, of small neighborhoods. It all has to become this huge money-making monstrosity. Anybody who could see visually Dinky Town in the 30s, in the 50s, in the 60s, and went over there today, it's like a futuristic horror movie. It's a futuristic dystopia. The kind of way they have taken, like House of Hansen, all these places, and it has been taken over by almost non-human dimensions and non-human ways of life. So to me, it is something that was part of, uh, I don't know if it's a word, but almost a spiritual space, and certainly uh, an alternative space. And it's been turned into the absolute worst possible example of futurism and where we're headed. What would you like to ask, Cindy? Ed Feline in the Varsity Theater. Oh, Ed. Uh, Eddie was a character. I didn't have a lot to do with Eddie during that Varsity Theater, but Ed, Eddie was uh, a major figure in all of these kinds of events. And he had later the Modern Times Cafe in South Minneapolis, which in its own way tried to recreate some of the atmosphere. He put out a newspaper at that time, and he was doing it in the West Bank. It was called Hundred Flowers. Uh, and he, it was what the Berkeley Barb was to Berkeley, and the Village Voice was to the village in New York. Eddie's Hundred Flowers was sort of that. He had a commune up in the country, so Eddie was one who moved back and forth between the politics but also the countercultural aspects. Uh, and he was in his own way a real leader and a lot of young people gathered around Eddie. Now we haven't hit anything about uh, much about Al. I got a story to tell you about Al. Okay, go ahead. Um, Al was a, a, a very precarious instructor in the humanities department at the U, U for years. And I became <clears throat> a, uh, first a uh, student in the humanities department, and then a teaching assistant. And Al was always working an angle. This is Al Milgram. Al Milgram. And he literally at that time, I didn't realize it, but in the late 50s, early 60s, Al was the venue for international and foreign film, not just in this area, but in the country. He knew everybody. Well, I was one of his gophers. The guys who would go around Dinky Town and staple every telephone post, all of that kind of stuff, run errands, and he was sort of short-tempered. Yeah, he could be pretty grumpy some days. But he was doing all this work, and one of the fun stories about Al, I and a guy named Bill, I can't remember his last name anymore, we were preparing, the, Al was bringing in Jean-Luc Godard, and he had a film on the Rolling Stones, and it was a big event. He, it actually, I think we had Northrop Auditorium, it was such a big deal. And it got close, and he assigned Bill and I to pick up Godard at the airport. Well, Bill came up with this idea. At that stage, Godard was in his Maoist phase, and he was redder than thou. And we cooked up this scheme that there was an abandoned house, and we were going to plant cameras in there, hidden cameras. But after we got him from the airplane, 
we were going to drive him to this house, hold him hostage, and film it while we interrogated him for not being read enough that he was actually a bourgeois sellout. Well, Al got word of it, and he put the kibosh on that. He was mad as hell. But it turns out, Mil uh, Goddard, when he hears the story, when we're out having coffee with him, he's pissed off at Al. Why did you interfere with that? I could have made a movie out of that alone. He was really upset with Milgram that he had messed with the story. But through that, I, he and I became friends. And uh, he and he had a guy that was traveling with him. But the next couple of times he went through the country, they came and hung out with I and my girlfriend. And uh, But it was that was the kind of world Dinky Tom was. You didn't know who was going to show up what book tour happened with an international uh, filmmaker or a book or whatever, but how was that kind of character? I don't think anybody has really yet, even with films, everything else, what Bill Graham was. You, you remember Bill Graham in the film war? I mean, for music, that's sort of what Al was for international film. He brought people in nobody in Minneapolis and St. Paul had ever heard of. And then they realized who they were. Oh, that's Bergman. That's this. That's what, you know. So Al is a figure that I don't think until history is really written will get his due for what a, a quirky, brilliant man he was and the role, the important role he played in the arts and culture in the Twin Cities.